Hello zombies! Today we are getting down and dirty with this kind of steampunk, kind of industrial, kind of Mad Max post-apocalyptic thing coming out of our faces. I wasn't going for something that made any anatomical sense, I just wanted to make something that I thought looked cool. And if you didn't already know, this combo of styles is my aesthetic, so I'm all about this look. There's a lot of information that I feel is really important for both the prosthetic making and the application, as well as some new things we haven't gone over on this channel before, so rather than trying to water down a bunch of info into one 20 minute video, I've decided to split this look into two parts, the prep work and the application. This will hopefully be the most helpful to those looking to do this exact look or taking pieces of information to create your own. So this video just covers the prep work, i.e. the materials, prosthetic making, painting, and distressing. Part two, or the application video, will follow in a few days. So if you're watching this sometime into the future, then it's already up and it will be linked at the end of this video as well as in the description box below. All right, now let's get to it, from scratch. First, let's talk about what you'll need for this because it's not your average list of FX supplies. You'll want to raid your local hardware store for some industrial type things. A mix of nuts and washers. Make sure you get varying sizes and metals so that you have different color options. Copper flashing and or this rolled metal sheeting fence looking kind of thing. Or any thin bendable pieces of metal-y stuff. This is to add some texture to your prosthetic without weighing it down with all the nuts and washers. And then you want some kind of small and flexible tubing. I have heat shrink tubing and latex tubing. You'll also need some other things from miscellaneous places to get the rusting effect on your prosthetics, goggles, accessories, etc. Distilled white vinegar, regular table salt, and 3% hydrogen peroxide to mix together and make a scientific concoction. You'll need satin finish clear spray paint to eventually seal the rust effect in. Some kind of liquid glue like Elmer's and iron powder, which is the tricky one to find. I bought mine online from eBay and it's specifically iron minus 325 mesh, but I believe several types of iron powder would also work. I bought a pound to be safe, but I definitely did not use anywhere close to that for this look. For safety, sanitation, and comfort purposes, it's also a good idea to have a pair of gloves for this project, a surgical mask or respirator, and a disposable or easy to clean work surface. I worked on top of these styrofoam boards that padded something that I received in the mail. As far as FX supplies go for the prep, you'll need a life cast. This is not something you could do directly onto your face. You can sculpt on a curved surface of any kind if you don't have a life cast, but it would be much more accurate and easy on a life cast. So life casts are not something you should do on your own. You will need help from another person or two, and there is a lot of bad or dangerous information online about how to make your own. I will link a good life cast tutorial to follow in the description down below. You'll need petroleum jelly as a release agent. We'll be building this with cotton and latex rather than sculpt and making a mold, so you'll need some of that. You'll need some sort of FX paints. I'm using alcohol activated paints, but you can use cream paints or water activated paints as well. If you use alcohol activated paints, you will also need 99% alcohol. And other than that, you'll just need some basic tools, some makeup sponges, a palette knife, and inexpensive brushes. Okay, with that out of the way, we can start sailing through the steps. I'm beginning on my life cast, which is greased up with petroleum jelly so that our prosthetic will peel off easily when we're done. Lay a layer of latex down where you'll be making the prosthetic. And then I'm using a flat cotton sheet I cut out in the shape and size of what I want the base of the prosthetic to be. Sit that down on top of the first layer of latex, then cover it in more latex. At the time, all I knew was that I wanted the mouth area to be ripped open to reveal all of those protruding industrial pieces. You can do yours anywhere, just make sure you consider what consequences might come with your placement. Areas that go over the smile lines mean that you won't be able to move your face a lot without risking it peeling somewhere. Prosthetics that cover your entire mouth like this one mean you obviously will not be able to eat or drink anything once it's on, so wear time is limited. If you cover up your nose, you'd have to breathe through only your mouth. If you had a piece that connected from, say, your jaw to your neck, you'd have a difficult time moving your head from side to side, etc, etc. You can do any of these things, you just want to know what you're getting yourself into is all. So once I have the base ready, I start sticking random nuts and washers where I see fit. Piecing something together like this will be different for everyone, but what I can say is that it's usually beneficial to avoid perfect symmetry or evenly spacing things apart. You want some things to be closer together than others, you want to put something copper next to something silver sometimes, but you don't want to do copper, silver, copper, silver. You want to vary sizes and heights, but again, not in any discernible pattern. The copper flashing and what I'm calling the little metal fence looking thing, even though it's only a tall enough fence to house maybe like your toes, these things come in handy to avoid all the objects in the prosthetic looking too circular, and also to cut down on the weight of the prosthetic, which would be an issue if it became too heavy to attach to the face. I cut randomly shaped pieces and laid them down where I wanted to break up the circular pattern. You'll see me messing around with the Elmer's glue because latex wasn't enough to keep some of the objects sturdily in place, but that didn't do much either, so I reinforced most things by building up a little bit of torn up cotton ball and latex on the sides. And that worked wonderfully. Also, you should know something. 
I sliced my thumb at one point handling the copper flashing, though I didn't notice I broke the skin until the next day. Think paper cut, but with an insanely sharp piece of metal instead. So for that reason, I highly recommend you wear some kind of gloves when working with that or the silver metal fencing because that's also very sharp. I ended up going to a clinic the next day just to, uh, to get a tetanus shot. You know, just in case. Nothing to play around with. Okay, so you'll see I start messing with my tubing options to see where they'd best fit in with what I've already got going on. I used any corner or nut that would hold the tubing to try different locations. I liked crisscrossing the black heat shrink tubing just over the center of the mouth. Something about that seemed kind of creepy. And for the heat shrink tubing, I just blasted them with a hair dryer on the hot setting for about a minute and they shrink down and they become malleable so you can bend them to the arc that you need them and then let them cool in that shape. Again, I attached those by adding a tiny bit of latex soaked cotton on each ends and anchoring that to something else in the prosthetic. I still wasn't sure what to do with that big piece of latex tubing on the far end of the prosthetic, so I moved on to the next step for now, which was building up the torn skin around the exposed industrial parts. This is a basic cotton and latex build, which we do in many other tutorials on this channel, but more or less, I lay down latex along the edge of my base, rip some cotton from a cotton ball and lay that down on top of the wet latex, and that holds onto it long enough for me to cover that cotton in more latex. Then you're able to shape the cotton and latex however you wish. In this case, it's just being pulled upwards with frayed ends to kind of mimic a ripped skin kind of look. It's definitely not the most realistic way to mimic skin compared to other FX supplies, but it is very inexpensive, easy to work with, and it's the easiest to take off of a life cast and reapply onto your face later. A tip for this part is I pull at the ends of the cotton and latex while they're still starting to dry to get that PC look, and it also helps to send those ends in different directions, some which fold down into the piece and some which are kind of blown open. If it's all blown open and away from the prosthetic, it would kind of look funny, and if it was all folded in towards the prosthetic, that would look funny as well, and you'd also miss out on a lot of your work underneath. So the bottom piece is effectively done as far as the building goes, and that's when I decided on bringing that latex tubing up to the forehead to connect it to another nut. I did the same process as for the mouthpiece up here, just on a much smaller scale. Laid down a base, attached the nut, reinforced with some cotton and latex, and built up the sides to simulate the ripped skin. I also stuck a tiny piece of copper flashing in the very bottom of the wound for a little extra color. I left that tube that will go from the forehead piece to the mouthpiece out of any permanent connection right now because if I glued that tube into both sides, it would make applying the pieces much more difficult and likely to break apart at some point. Later, I ran a piece of craft store metal wiring through the tube just to make it a little more sturdy, but all I needed to do was make sure my two prosthetic pieces were placed not too far apart on my face and stick the tube in. The outward push on the opposite directions of each anchoring nut kept it in place really easily. Once your cotton and latex is all dry, we can move on to painting and rusting. To paint, I'll be using this alcohol activated palette that has a lot of dirt colors, browns and grays, etc since that will go best with all of the metal pieces. For inside the mouthpiece, I'm just using a wash of those browns and grays to fill in any white spots I see from the cotton showing through. I don't use it to paint over any of the items we've attached in there. For the skin area outside the mouth, I first paint the cotton a medium wash of brown. This is because I find that darkening the cotton overall first makes it much easier to get the right skin shade, even if you're very pale like me. If you put a pale color on top of the white cotton, it tends to always be too bright. Put a medium wash of brown down first and you can control the color much easier. Now, I'm doing this all on my life cast, so I don't know if this is currently going to be an exact skin match, but I want to get it somewhere close for now so that I have a little less painting to do during the application where it's harder to see all angles. Okay, on to what I think is the funnest part of all of this, the rust effect. I read and watched a million things online about how to rust various types of materials and most of them went over the same general products but I ended up using Kemu Cosplay's exact rust concoction ratios and steps to do this one because she seemed to have the most success on all different types of materials with this. So shout out to her amazing channel, thank you Kemu Cosplay! I'll link the video I found this in the description down below. It includes an adorable corgi in a rusty armor outfit, so I just don't know why you wouldn't check it out. How, how could you not want to see that? Okay, so anyway, to make sure you can easily see what I'm doing here, I'm showing you the process on this test patch of copper flashing and the metal fencing first. You start by painting your glue onto the areas you want to rust, then you add the iron powder on top of the glue. Then you want to mix 1 parts table salt, 4 parts vinegar, and 6 parts hydrogen peroxide into a spray bottle. Spray your metal piece and iron powder with that. You'll see it starts to drip rusty colors right away, which is why you want to work on a surface that you can throw out later or clean easily. 
It's also helpful to wear gloves again because you're working with that sharp metal sheeting, but also because this is just a really messy process. I chose to wear a surgical mask during this just to avoid inhaling any iron powder, which is apparently not actually dangerous, but I still wanted to avoid it. Also because the vinegar smell at this point is really, really stinky. So any extra protection I can get for my nose, I will take in that case. Speaking of safety, wanted to make a quick note that while we often associate rust with tetanus, rust itself is not what causes tetanus and it is not dangerous. None of this rust is going directly onto your face for any reason anyway, just the prosthetic, but even working with it to this extent is nothing to worry about. What does cause tetanus are spores from soil, dust, and animal crap, which can be found on pieces of metal. Which is why when I sliced my thumb open on the non-rusty copper flashing, I got my tetanus shot to be safe as it could have lived on there. Okay, tetanus lesson complete. So in Chemo Cosplay's video, she added more pure hydrogen peroxide on top of all of this to get it to rust instantly. I did not see the same results when I did that, as in it wasn't immediate, but I did see significant rust when I left it overnight. I put the same liquids on it one more time the next day and it rusted even more and that time instantly. So for best results, I would suggest you don't wear this the same day that you plan on rusting it. Here's some pictures of how it looked because the color and detail is pretty hard to see in the video, but it turned out amazing. I'd rust every surface of everything I own if that wasn't really messy and impractical. So that whole process I did over the entire insides of both prosthetic pieces, all over the washers, nuts, flashing, fencing, the tubes on the inside of the ripped skin, everywhere except the outside skin areas with the exception of a drip or two. This iron powder combo will rust anything. I went back to rust it some more the next day like I mentioned and I noticed that the rust inside had darkened the outside of the skin on one area. So to correct that I just painted more opaque washes of alcohol activated paints on top. And that seemed to fix it. When you're happy with the amount of rust you got going on, it would be smart to seal it. The rust flakes off easily and since we'll have to touch this a fair amount to attach it to our faces in the next video, you want to do all that you can to keep it where it is. I used this satin finish clear spray paint, sat it outside, misted over it in an even coat, and left it to dry for a day. And the latex tubing was flaking the worst of all, so I actually used a little bit of liquid latex on the edges of that rust to seal it. The only downside with the clear spray paint is for some reason it gave the overall prosthetic this kind of white coating and reduced those really rich oranges and reds from the rust. Might have been a reaction with the salts in that spray, not really sure. It was kind of cool because it made it look extra dirty and dusty, but I would have preferred without it. Maybe a clear nail polish would have helped to avoid that, but it would have taken much, much, much longer and it also would have been glossy, which I don't think is the right finish for a look like this. So anyway, as you can see, I repeated the rusting process on this pair of steampunk goggles that I found off Amazon. They're just plastic and yet you can still get them to rust. I will link the exact ones in the description below. You can do this process on any accessory you have for this look. And that, my zombies, is the end of the prep work. Very carefully pick up a corner of your prosthetic piece and pry it free. It won't peel back since it's full of stiff objects, but the piece should more or less pop off once the contact underneath is broken. Good things come to those who stay to the end of the tutorial. Here's a quick preview of how the final look turned out. Stay tuned for part two, which includes the industrial type glam to go with the application of these pieces and a costume that brings it all together. Catch you over there. Bye.